So the past few years have been a roller coaster ride in the real estate market, not just here in Charleston, but everywhere. We've seen rates from the twos all the way up to almost eight. So today I have my friend, Dr. Joey Von Nessen back, and we're going to be talking about the future of real estate and the economy going through 2024 and beyond. Joey, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bill. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I don't want to waste any time because we have a lot to talk about and a lot of great information for everyone. And I want to open up because you, in your speech that you did for our association, you talked that today, this year would be a year of readjustment. Now, this is also something that you said last year during our video, that last year was a re year of readjustment. So how is this readjustment different than last year's readjustment? Because last year, kind of, we saw those rates hit that eight. No one really expected that. So, so how is this different than last year? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. And in a very real sense, 2024 will be an extension of the readjustment that we saw in 2023. And I think stepping back for a moment, it's important to set the context of where the housing market and the broader economy are right now. And I would consider this period the great readjustment, this current economic paradigm that we're in. And it, it seems like we're always calling everything, starting uh, everything with great these days, right? We had the great recession, then we had the great expansion over the last uh, 10 years from basically 2010 to 2020, a long period of steady economic growth. And following the pandemic, we're now in a period of readjustment, the great readjustment, where we're getting back to pre-pandemic norms and an equilibrium between supply and demand that has really been disrupted because of the, of the COVID pandemic and the COVID recession, where demand has exceeded uh, supply. So this is an extension of the great readjustment period. It's continuing into 2024. And what we're expecting to be different this year is that housing, the housing market in general, is really on the backside of the readjustment, meaning that we should begin to see more stabilization in 2024, particularly from a sales perspective. And we see this in the data in the Charleston market and in South Carolina. So for example, we saw double digit declines in sales activity in 2022. We saw single digit declines in 2023, but it's rapidly approaching zero. So we're, we're leveling out at sales activity that's more comparable to what we saw in 2019 before the pandemic began. So we can talk about interest rates in just a moment, but in general, we're seeing basically the housing market, the, the bulk of the readjustment period is likely behind us. We'll see more stability in 2024. And so we're expecting relatively flat growth this year, or even perhaps small positive rates of, of sales gains in 2024, um, based on where we stand right now in February. So a lot of that, you know, I, I read a lot of the headlines and then you, know, you got to read the articles because everything is saying, like you said, sales were down, sales were down, sales, sales were down, but inventory was down. Yes. So the, the percentage of sales to inventory was the same or a little greater but the total number was down yet the interest rates got up. So things did slow in that sense. We weren't seeing 45 offers on homes. Sometimes we were only seeing one to three. So I think that's a big readjustment, you know, but if rates do start going down, that's going to all change again. So yes. with those rates, you know, we saw a six and a half percent average last year, which was over double what we saw the, the two years previous. This year, we've already seen as low as almost six and a half to 7.1. What do you think is going to happen this year? Because the predictions are all over the place, depending on where you're getting your sources. Yes. And and the, the answer really comes down to what the Federal Reserve decides to do with respect to, to the federal funds rate with interest rate policy. And that's going to be dictated by what inflation does. So, so really, it's all about inflation. Does inflation continue to move down towards 2%, which is the Federal Reserve's target? Or does it stay sticky, what I would call sticky, at around 3%? So if we look at inflation and how it's been tracking over the last two years or so, it peaked at 9.1% back in 2022. It's come down to 3.1%. That's the current inflation rate. And the Fed is trying to get it down to 2.0%. So kind of three numbers there, 9.1, 3.1 where we are today, and 2.0. 
And over the last several months, inflation has basically gotten stuck at around 3%. So it's bounced around, if you look at the data, between about 3 and 3.5%. Three and, and so the big question is whether that's a temporary blip and inflation will continue to, to trickle down towards 2% in 2024, or is it going to get stuck? And if it gets stuck at around 3%, the Fed is likely to leave interest rates higher for longer. And that implies that we won't see as much of a decline in mortgage interest rates in, in 2024. The flip side is that if we do continue to see inflation come down towards 2%, then the Fed would be more likely to lower interest rates in the second half of 2024. And so we'd We'd, we'd see some return to, to mortgage interest rates that are more comparable to where we were back in 2019. We're not going to get back to 3% uh, this year by any means. I don't want to suggest that. But moving down from, let's say, 65 to 6% or, or, or perhaps even slightly below that, that's a possibility if inflation continues to move down towards 2% and motivates the Fed to, to take more aggressive action. Now, with the inflation, one thing you said in your talk that that housing is the front lines in the battle against inflation. Yes. So explain that a little bit. Yes, that's exactly right. And what I mean by that is that when you are battling inflation, as the Federal Reserve is, the way that they pull inflation down is by raising interest rates. That's their tool. Because remember, all, all raising interest rates does is it increases the cost of borrowing money. So it makes things more expensive for businesses and for, and for consumer consumers and of course for potential home buyers as well. And so that's going to lower demand and lowering demand is going to pull inflation down. So anytime you raise interest rates to combat inflation, the housing market is going to be hit first and it's going to be hit hardest. And that's because housing is the most expensive item that most Americans buy. And so when you raise the cost of a house from the perspective of the home buyer, uh, that's going to impact demand. And, and that's exactly what we've seen. And that's why we saw a double digit pullback in sales activity in 2022 that then began to taper in, in 2023. So the, the bulk of that readjustment for the housing market occurred in 2022 and in the early parts of 2023. And that's why we're more optimistic that we'll see some stability this year, because most of that readjustment from these higher interest rates in terms of the pullback of demand is is now behind us. But that could also go opposite with if demand gets high. You know, yeah, we're, I don't think we'll ever see twos or threes again, um, at least maybe in our lifetime. It, I, I don't want to, to be honest with you. I don't want to. That was it's not stable. Correct. But yes. To a five would be great. And, and that's possible. Again, I, do, I don't know that that will happen in 2024. Again, we're talking about small changes uh, that we're expecting for, for mortgage interest rates this year. But the, the best case scenario in terms of, of if we're looking for lower mortgage interest rates uh, would be that the inflation rate for the U.S. continues to, to move downwards towards 2% at a steady rate. And that's going to make it more likely that the Federal Reserve will lower the federal funds rate, which will impact mortgage interest rates down the line, probably during the second half of, of 2024. And the other thing to mention when we're, when we're looking at uh, the changes and this readjustment is that, as you alluded to this uh, earlier, the high levels of, of growth that the housing market saw in Charleston and in South Carolina in 2020 and 2021 were not sustainable. Um, so this readjustment, while it is, is painful as, as we go through the process, uh, this was essentially inevitable that we would see this correction because the, the levels of demand, again, in 2020 and 2021 were far above historical trends, far above what we would expect in this market, and were a, basically a mini bubble is, is, is what we saw. So we're correcting that now. We're looking for more stability in 2024, and that should generate conditions for more slow and steady growth over time, which is more healthy, it's more sustainable and, and better for the housing market long run. Don't don't use the word bubble. That's a trigger word for some people. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Along with that, then, you know, that kind of goes into the economy and what's happening here in South Carolina, especially with jobs. And, you know, South Carolina last year had the highest percentage of growth in population than any other state. And now we've got two companies breaking ground 
with Scout Motors and Redwood Materials bringing in about 6,000 jobs once they open. And Volvo also expanding into their EV production here outside of Charleston with another 14 to 1500 jobs once that ramps up. And that's just three companies. So, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to continue that trend of being one of the highest per percentage increases in population, which is going to drive demand, which is also going to boost the, the real estate market along with our economy. Is that correct? Yes, that's exactly right. There's no question that we're going to continue to see very strong growth in South Carolina and especially in the Charleston market. So while we are uh, seeing this, this market correction, this readjustment that will continue in, into 2024 and will probably lead to, uh, again, either flat growth or very mild rates of, of positive growth, we can't let that distract us from the reality that we are very bullish on the long run outlook for, for Charleston and, and for South Carolina more generally, uh, and especially for, for housing. Uh, because as you said, we're seeing more and more um, business announcements and expansions in Charleston and in South Carolina. And this region of the country and South Carolina in particular are going to continue to see population gains for the foreseeable future. Every forecasting entity, including the census, shows cons consistently that the Southeast is going to see more population gains than any other region of the United States over the next two decades. And that includes South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina ranks number one in a variety of measures of recent population trends, some of which you, you just alluded to. Um, and, and the pandemic really uh, uh, generated more momentum for these trends, really exacerbated these trends. So that is great news for, for housing demand going forward. It means that these steady rates of growth that, that make a healthy, uh, make a health, make for a healthy housing market are going to continue, uh, certainly for the foreseeable future over the next decade. So, so population trends, the employment growth that we expect all generating very high levels of demand. Um, and, and that's, that's good news for the market as a whole. Now, now we can talk about the challenges associated with su the supply side of that, mm -hmm. but if you're in the housing industry, um, demand is, is in, in a very good position. And again, we're very bullish on the long run outlook for the Charleston market. Well, you, you did hint there at what I was going to bring up next was the, the home building and the inventory, and we are just way behind in that still. Yes. And, you know, even with the, the labor to build things and the material, it's, it's hard for builders to even keep up with that aspect of it, let alone just the demand. So I think that's going to play a lot into it. We have so many people coming in, but we have to build houses for them. I know a lot of people that are here in South Carolina are really going to hate hearing this because a lot of people are like anti-growth. They're like, no, everyone needs to leave. But the fact is these, these companies are bringing so many jobs in that they are going to have to, people are going to have to move here. They're going to have to build more homes. Yes. There's, there's no way around it. Exactly. And, and inventory has been uh, certainly a challenge. It, it, and, and that's because of uh, really two factors. One, we've had a decade long period of underbuilding in Charleston and in South Carolina coming out of the, the Great Recession. Um, many builders went bankrupt in 2008. Others were very worried about getting back into the market uh, due to low demand initially in the 2009, 2010 period. Uh, there were a lot of new regulations that were put in place that also made them very wary of, of starting new projects. But basically as a result of that, we've seen a decade long period where even though population has continued to grow in South Carolina, uh, inventory has, has not kept up. And then if you fast forward to 2022, when interest rates started rising, we saw that existing homeowners were less likely to want to sell, right? Because they, many of them are locked into a 3% or a 4% mortgage interest rate, which is, which is great for them. Um, and so if you're asking them to sell, to move to a home where they've got to now look at a six or 7% mortgage interest rate, that's not so attractive. Um, and so they're less likely to want to sell. And so that exacerbates the lack of inventory. And that's why we've seen over the last two years, prices continue to rise in Charleston. The median home prices continue to go up, despite the fact that we've seen this double digit decline in sales activity, which is highly unusual. Normally you see 
the the direction of sales and the direction of prices basically move move together. And that has not been the case over the past two years. We've seen this major pullback in in sales, but fairly stable uh, increases in in prices. And it's because of this lack of inventory. So that's going to be a, a continuous challenge going forward, and something that we have to something that has to be a priority for the market. And you know here in Charleston, a third of our homes for sale are new construction. And even though that inventory is still low, the builders are just offering these crazy incentives right now, which actually makes new construction homes more affordable from a payment standpoint than a resale home. So that's, that's going to be a contributing factor for resale homes. Everyone has to compete with a builder saying, here's a brand new home in a five, five and a half percent interest rate. Even though that home might be 30, 40 grand more, the payment's still going to be less for that. And that's going to kind of make, that makes things a little interesting on how, on the different sectors of that market, resale versus new. Yes. A lot of people don't realize that I can get the new homes more expensive, but I can qualify for that because I can get a, five and a half percent rate as opposed to a six, seven, five. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable what we've seen in terms of the change in that distribution between the sales of new and uh, new homes and uh, and resales just in the last four or five years. Um, and, and again, you alluded to this before, but, uh, you know, our data even show uh, stronger changes. Basically, we went from in, in the Charleston market now uh, went from about 28 percent of all sales were we're coming from new construction. Now it's around 50, uh, the latest estimates that, that we've seen in early 2024. So that's a, just a huge swing in a very short period of time from 2019 to uh, 2023, early 2024. Um, and, and so this creates these different dynamics, the different pricing dynamics and different types of competition uh, in, in the local market. And, and this is going to continue. Again, this is a, still a very unbalanced market that is, that is moving back and is continuing to adjust. Yeah, and you know, kind of tie all this together with the new construction and then the jobs economy, where these jobs are coming in. So Scout is in Blythewood, but they're bringing 4,000 jobs and Blythewood's population is like 5,500. So they need to build a ton of homes for these people. Ridgeville is getting 3,000 jobs. So they need to start building more and they are building more up there. But so if you're kind of looking for a cheap house now, like those are good areas to look because the demand is really going to rise once these companies start hiring and people start relocating here. But there is one other little wrench this year that we have and that it's an election year. So how is that going to tie into all of this? Because the politicians want rates low because that makes people happy. Yes. But uh, so what, what do you see happening with all of that? Well, from an election standpoint, um, we don't tend to see a, a significant impact on the economy necessarily during, during an election year overall, taking a 30,000 foot view. Um, but uh, when we look at interest rate policy, we, we want to carefully parse what the Fed is saying, but they have been very clear that they are doing their best to stay out of politics and focus on preventing recession getting inflation down and preventing recession. That is that is what the Fed wants to do. And from, from that perspective, we have to, to think about what their motivation really is in terms of, of interest rate policy, given that they're trying to prevent a recession. So remember that the Fed, uh, their mission is to create price stability, meaning that we want low inflation and full employment, right? So they wanna do both of those things. And we've seen, as, as again, as you're alluding to, a very, very strong labor market in the last several years. Unemployment in South Carolina is currently at 3%, 3.0%, which is uh, about as low as it's ever been. At the U.S. level, unemployment is 3.7%, again, uh, at, at historic lows. So if you're the Fed and you have this dual mandate of creating full employment, and keeping prices stable and inflation low, then from an employment perspective, things look pretty good, which means you have more flexibility to be patient on the interest rate side. And that's why it's so important 
to track inflation as to what it's doing this year to get a sense of where interest rates are going to go. Because since we have full employment, since the labor market is so strong, the Fed really doesn't have any reason to lower interest rates uh, or, or they, they don't have a reason to lower interest rates un, until they are very certain that inflation is going to get down to 2%. So if we continue to see it move down in the coming months, we're more likely to see the Fed take action. And again, that could move us uh, to, to lower mortgage interest rates, maybe get us below 6%, um, perhaps more than that. We'll see. But, but really, the key factor is how quickly inflation continues to subside this year. That, that's what's going to drive interest rate policy. And so I want to finish up with just asking you one thing here about the good and the bad. So with everything that's going on, you know, what are the good things we need to, to celebrate and keep our eyes on, but also what are the, the downsides and the bad things that are going on that can kind of help people grasp the whole picture, the big picture? So great question. Yes. And I, I think, and, and you're right, we do have good news and, and bad news for 2024. And I would argue more good news uh, than, than bad because this economy has been very resilient, particularly in South Carolina. And as we look forward to the main drivers of housing demand, remember what, what, are, the, what are the main drivers of housing demand? Well, it's population growth. Number one, as more people move in, they're going to need housing. And we're seeing uh, no sign that population growth is going to abate in Charleston. And if anything, it's going to continue to remain stable or perhaps increase further. We see a very strong labor market. Uh, and the single best predictor for housing demand is employment growth. People uh, most of the time can't buy a house if they don't have a job. The labor market remains very strong. And thirdly, consumer spending has remained uh, resilient and consistent throughout 2023 and going into 2024. And if we look at the different factors that drive uh, a consumer's balance sheet, they're just looking at the financial health of, of households, it remains strong and consumers are continuing to spend. And that means that we'll likely continue to see high levels of demand this year. So all signs point for positive growth in 2024. And so when you couple that with the fact that the readjustment of the housing market, the movement away from that unsustainably high level of demand that we saw in 2020 and 2021, that that is largely behind us. Uh, that sets up uh, the housing market to have a have a better year, certainly than where we were in, in 2023. Again, relatively flat or perhaps even even slightly positive growth. The downside, the downside associated with with uh, 2024 is that inflation still remains elevated. And we have seen most Americans that have been adversely affected by high, by high inflation. Uh, so they've lost purchasing power, and that's going to make them a bit more skittish about spending than, than they were a year or two ago. So when you couple a loss in purchasing power with higher interest rates, then that's, again, it just it, it, it makes it not quite as appealing for, for many buyers. So that's, that's still a, a, a cautionary tale. So uh, there's still some readjustment there. Um, we're still seeing inflation coming down. We don't know how quickly it's going to come down to 2%. So inflation is really still the wild card. And that loss of purchasing power uh, that consumers have seen reflects the really the, the, the scenario that, uh, that really limits what consumers and businesses can do. So that's where, what we see on the bad side. But, but I think the uh, the, the good news and the stability and the fact that most of this readjustment is behind us in the housing market, um, that's really going to dominate. So we're, again, more optimistic about 2024 for, for housing. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, are there any other parting words or things that you want people to know about what this year could bring? Well, I think just the, the, the bottom line is that when we look at what's going to drive housing demand in 2024, uh, most signs look good. And we just have to think back to the, the basics. And that comes down to population growth, comes down to a strong labor market and, and the cost. What, what are interest rates going to do? And so for the first two, we are in, in very good shape. And for interest rates, we know that they're either going to stay roughly where they are or, or perhaps uh, decline this year. So, um, all three factors basically suggest uh, that we can be optimistic about this year. 
All right. Well, thank you again for joining us. It's always great to have you on. I, I have nothing else, everyone. Thank you so much for watching and check out this video right here. Um, there's a lot of great information. If you want to see what his prediction was last year, I'm going to put that right over here and you kind of compare what we are doing year over year. So Dr. Von Nessen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Bill. Always my pleasure.